Hello, welcome. Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Meredith Newmark. I'm the U.S. Program Manager here at Atlas Core, um, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Um, I, I hope um, all of you are able to um, hear me okay and, and see us okay, but if you're not, um, you can just type in any questions or technical difficulties you're having in the chat box of the YouTube webinar, um, and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to get to your questions later. Um, we're going to hold all questions to the end. Um, but um, briefly, I, I want to introduce my co-host, um, Dipanita. Um, why don't you say a little bit about yourself? Um, hi, my name is Dipanita, and I'm an Atlas Core fellow from India, and I serve as the training manager at Atlas Core. Um, before uh, joining the fellowship, I, I started an organization back home, and I worked as a digital media strategist for nonprofits. Um, it's, it's, I'm on my 10th month now, and I just uh, extended my fellowship. Uh, which means that I'll be here for a full 18 months. I'll post that I hope to go back home and continue working on my own organization, uh, possibly building it a little more. I'll I mean, the fellowship so far has been it has been really, really amazing. Uh, it's a lot of learning. It's a great group of people, and possibly one of the best networking opportunities I could have ever asked for. Fantastic. Um, so, um, as as U.S. program manager, I manage the application process for the U.S. fellowship. Um, so. The agenda for today is I'm going to give a very brief overview of Atlas Core. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail because I imagine um, most of you have already read through our website somewhat already, um, but I'll do a brief overview um, and then we're going to jump into what we consider to be our top 12 um, frequently asked questions, uh, the questions that applicants like yourselves um, ask us the most. Um, and um, and uh, try and answer those questions for you. Um, and like I said, any, any questions that you have, we're going to hold towards the end. Um, and you can also email questions to apply at atlascore.org. Um, and if you have questions during the, uh, the uh, webinar, you can just type them in the chat box. All right, so, so just a brief overview of Atlas Core. Um, we're an international network of nonprofit leaders from around the world um, that promotes innovation, cooperation, and solutions to address critical um, 21st century challenges. And our, our mission is to address these issues by developing leaders, strengthening organizations, and promoting innovation through this overseas fellowship um, of skilled nonprofit professionals. And um, we engage leaders in a six to 18 month fellowship um, where Fellows do on-the-job training um, and, and learn um, by serving directly with host organizations um, in the U.S. Um, as well as Colombia uh, in South America. Um, and uh, fellows learn best practices, they build capacity of their organizations, and then they return home to create this network of global change makers. Um, and, uh, and you know, we have a broad range of issues that our fellows are working on, everything from education to the environment to human rights, um, you name it, um, and a wide variety of skill sets that they're employing from research to training management to um, volunteer recruitment, public speaking, you know, a, a wide range of, of things that our fellows are doing. Um, and uh, they, they work on issues that complement their expertise and develop their leadership skills as well. Um, and then this, all of this, um, this practical hands-on knowledge is supplemented by, um, by a, a theoretical um, and, and, and practical training as well presented in the ASCOR um, Global Leadership Lab. So, um, which is what Ponta manages as our training manager. Um, and uh, among uh, that's one of the benefits of being an Ascore fellow. But among those other benefits, um, besides the uh, uh, you know the training um, and the global leadership lab, Ascore also covers a, a basic living stipend that we'll talk a little bit more about later, as well as the flight and the cost and sponsorship of a visa. 
Um, I want to add that most fellowships are 12 months. Um, some fellows extend another six months, like Ponta here, um, who we're very excited to have with us for another six months um, and a total of 18 months altogether. Um, in 2014, we'll have a handful of special initiatives that you can read about on our website, um, on the uh, apply page of our website, um, that uh, are, are six months. So for example, um, we're starting a new initiative um, sponsored by the Office of the Special Envoy to Sudan and South Sudan um, within the State Department. Um, and that, that fellowship, um, we've already had a number of Sudanese fellows um, come here in 2013, and then 2014 we're expanding it to South Sudan as well. Um, and we expect to bring um, 10 South Sudanese leaders here, and it'll be a six-month fellowship. Um, we also are going to be having a Think Tank Links Fellowship, um, which is specifically for um, researchers, researchers at think tanks um, who do research on political and economic reforms um, and would be serving for six months at think tanks in the U.S. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about those special initiatives. Um, you can read more about them on our website. The application process is um, the same. You fill out the same application as you do for our um, classic U.S. fellowship. Um, and if you have further questions about those specific programs, um, you should email apply to Um So, um, so that's a, that's a little bit of an overview about the fellowship itself. Um, and and DePont has talked a little bit about herself. So, um, so the most of this webinar, uh, I want to be covering the um, the frequently asked questions that we hear from applicants. Um, so, um, Depanta is going to ask um, the questions that she had when she first heard about the fellowship um, and was thinking about applying, um, and I'm going to answer them as best as I can. <laughs> Great. So my first question, of course, was how do I apply? Sure. So um, first you should make sure you fit the eligibility requirements. Um, and those requirements are that you have a bachelor's degree um, or, or, or degree, an equivalent degree um, from a four-year um, college or university, um, that you're proficient in English, both spoken and written, um, and that you have two to ten years of experience, approximately. Um, and that you're age 35 or young or, or under um, on the first day of the fellowship. Uh, you can turn 36 during the course of the fellowship and still be eligible. Um, and then the final eligibility requirement is that you're committed to returning home at the end of the fellowship for at least one year. So, um, so that's those are the eligibility requirements, and you should um, consider whether that description fits you um, before you necessarily um, apply. Um, once, once you've determined, oh, this seems like a, a good fit for me, I am eligible, um, it's a three-step process. You fill out an online application. Um, if you go to apply.atlascore.org, um, there's a link there to, um, you know, apply, apply to, for the U.S. Fellowship, um, and then there's a link there to the online application. Um, and it's, uh, the online application covers... Um, your education, your employment history, you'll also be asked to list your, your top four skills and your top four interest areas, um, those things like education, environment, etc. Um, and then to, um, there are six, three, six essay questions of about 300 words or less. Um, so I don't think they're, they're, they're not super long essay questions, uh, mostly a paragraph or two. Um, and so, um, you know, we we find that application to be, um, you know, that, that can take anywhere from a few hours to complete to, um, you know, a couple days of a, a few hours each. Um, and you would also uh, attach recommendation letters to, um, to your application, and there's a process described in the instructions of how to do that. So um, that's the first step is the online application with the recommendations. The second step uh, is if you have a, have a good application and um, we're, we're interested in learning more about you, um, we'll send you an English test. It's a timed written English test of one hour uh, for two essay questions. Um, and so, so 
we'll, we'll send you a login um, if, if we if we want to move you on to the next step um, for how to take the English test um, in an hour. And then if you pass both of those first steps, um, first two steps, and you have a strong application, you have a good English test, we think you have um, English that's strong enough to um, function in a US work environment, um, then we'll, um, we'll invite select applicants to, um, to do a Skype interview um, of about 20 to 30 minutes um, by Skype with our, um, our selection board. So, um, so those are the three steps to becoming a finalist for the U.S. Fellowship. And then once we've determined that you had a strong application, a strong English test, and a strong interview, um, that select group of applicants are what we consider to be finalists. Um, we consider them to be eligible to be um, placed with a host organization. And then we go about matching people with host organizations. Not all finalists get matched with the host organization. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, you know, the 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 final step to be being accepted is that an, a host organization interviews you and decides that they like to accept you for for their position. Um, and, and like I said, not everyone um, you know. There's amazing applicants who are finalists who don't reach that step necessarily. Um, but we you know we try to match people as best as we can. So. Um, the next obvious question, of course, is so how long will this entire process take? Great, yeah. So, um, like I mentioned before, the application itself can take anywhere from um, a few hours to maybe several days of a few hours each. Um, it, we, we don't think it's, it's uh, too burdensome uh, uh, an application because, like I said, those essay questions, they're really meant for like a couple paragraphs, um, 300 words or less. Um, and uh, so we, um, the application itself, not not super long, but um, long enough to get a sense of what your what your uh, fit for the fellowship might be. The overall selection process, um, those three going through those three steps I mentioned, um, that process can take up to four to five months for a single class. So, for example, right now in July, we're accepting applications for a class that begins in January 2014. Um, so that's um, that selection process can take um, a while, and, and we hope to notify applicants um, by like the end of October or early no November of their selection for um, the January fellowship, um, and, and it's cyclical. Um, so every four months, where um, you know the application is open year round, but every four months we're bringing in a new class of fellows. Um, that being said, um, really strong applicants who we consider like we we can we consider finalists and eligible to be placed with um, a host organization, they can be um, still considered for the fellowship for multiple classes up to a year after they apply. Um, after a year, we usually say you should just you should reapply. Um, it's been a year since you applied. You, you may have professional updates um, that we want to hear about. So, um, but up to a year. We'll continue to consider your application as long as you keep us informed about your current status, um, and we'll continue to try and match you with the host organization. Um, and it it really can, you know, it, it, some some fellows like the Conta um, who applied for class ten and then was placed with class ten. You know, sometimes it happens within one cycle. Um, some fellows it takes longer just to find that perfect match. Um, some fellows, you know. It may be waiting a year before they're matched with a host organization, um, but don't necessarily di get discouraged by that um, because we ha we have had fellows um, who who get placed with a host organization um, and a after a year of being considered a finalist and uh, and then it's it you know it, it it's the right match uh, like that we we're we're waiting for that perfect match you know we want to have have the host organization and the fellow um, uh, to be. Uh, thinking of this as a great opportunity for both of them. It needs to be a mutual fit. Um, finally, the last thing I'd like to say is that um, you know, you're not a fellow until you've been officially accepted uh, by a host organization. So we have lots of finalists um, in, in our application pool that we're considering for host organizations. Um, and, and like I said, it can take a while. So 
you shouldn't turn down any other offers until you've been officially accepted with a host organization. Um, you know, we sometimes get emails from finalists saying, I know I'm being considered, um, but I just got this other great offer. Um, keep us updated with, with your status, like what you're currently doing in your professional life. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you think that you'd like to withdraw your name from consideration, but um, until you've gotten a letter saying, this host organization wants to host you, um, you haven't been officially accepted yet, even if you're a finalist, someone that we consider to be eligible to be placed. Um, so there, you know, there's that distinction there, um, but please do keep us updated with your, um, with your professional status, and uh, if, if at any time you'd like to withdraw your name from consideration, um, please email us as, as soon as possible at apply at askcred.org so that we're not um, trying to place you with the host organization even after you've decide to withdraw your application. So that's a little bit about the application process. Um, while, while filling in the application, one of the other questions that I had is how do I know that I have enough experience for the fellowship? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and one that we get a lot. Um, you know, we say two to ten years of experience and then the, the obvious question is what counts as experience? Um, so there's a kind of broad definition that we're considering to be experienced in the social sector or the nonprofit sector. Um, that experience can include um, not just nonprofit organizations and NGOs, but also it can include government work, it can include teaching, um, it can include working at a, a for-profit business, um, if, it, if it's a socially minded business, some kind of social enterprise. Um, and then, you know, it could also um, it could also include significant volunteer experience. Um, you know, I, I would more be more likely to consider like a full time a volunteer program. Okay, I know some countries even have a, a year long service program. That we be some kind of significant uh, volunteer experience like that we can consider professional experience. Um, as well as consulting. So, so there's kind of a, a broad range of experiences that we would consider um, professional experience in the social sector. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're considering. Um, we have had fellows as young as 22 or 23 before, or only like a year or two out of college, um, but they've had significant volunteer experience that they can use to um, meet that requirement of at least two years of professional experience. Um, and that, that business experience can be relevant if it can be applied to the social sector, but, but we're really looking for um, someone who's committed to working in, in the social sector. Um. The next question, once you've made certain that your experience fits, is that how do you ensure, or how can I ensure that I have a good application? Great question. Um, so, um, there, there's a lot of things you can do to make sure that you have a strong application that grabs our attention and grabs host organizations' uh, attention. Um, one, just again, double check that you meet all the eligibility requirements. Um, they're really important because, um, you know, we, we want to, to make sure that, that you really are um, a good fit for the program. Um, make sure your, your English is clear and concise uh, and that you've checked over your spelling, your grammar. Um, have a friend who speaks um, good English to read over it and, and proofread it. Um, that's totally acceptable, um, but really do spend some time trying to make sure your spelling and grammar is you know, as great as possible. We, we realize that like English is a second or third or fourth language for many of our applicants, um, but in order to um, do well in the American work environment, they're looking for someone who's a strong writer um, and who can speak English well. So, um, so do make sure that you've um, tried to be clear and, and concise as well. Um, and the, the next thing I, I'd say is, is to, to make sure you're being detailed and offering as much um, specific detail as possible. So, for example, if you um, say that you did volunteer management, you know, try and follow that up with some specifics. Uh, how many volunteers did you manage? Um, how many did you recruit? Things like that. Or if you talk about your skill in grant writing, um, how much money was that grant? 
um, you know, how many grants did you were, were successfully accepted. Things like that, those little details really bump up your application from good to great um, because, uh, you know, if you go beyond just the bare minimum and, and really try to um, uh, show, show specifics of, of how you've taken leadership and how you could contribute to a host organization, um, that will really make your application stand out. Um, and then with uh, just to talk a little bit about the essay questions, the first essay question is for you to write a one paragraph um, bio, biography of yourself. Um, so, you know, uh, Merit Newmark has four years experience in the nonprofit sector and she's interested in um, volunteer management and capacity building, you know, kind of a, a one paragraph biogra biography of, about yourself and your professional experience. Really make sure that that biography is super strong because that's often the first thing that a host organization sees of your of your application. Um, when, when we're sending applications to potential host organizations, that that bio is the first thing they look at. So really do make make sure that you've put together a strong um, a strong paragraph about yourself, and we have a tips sheet uh, linked to in our application that you can read with some tips um, about making that bio strong. Um, I'd also say to um, really make sure you're getting across what you want to get across to a host organization. Think to yourself, um, if I had 30 seconds to talk to a potential host organization in the U.S., um, what would I want them to know about me? What are the three things that I want them to take away from my application? And really make sure that that comes through loud and clear, um, that these are your skills and this is how you can contribute. Um, and then one essay question that trips a lot of people up is, because uh, I think it is kind of maybe more of an American style question, um, is that asks um, to describe a success and a failure in your career. Um, and uh, we get a lot of applicants who um, have trouble with this question, have trouble describing a success, have trouble describing a failure. Um, in, in American, um, you know, interviews and, and applications, it's okay to talk about your failures um, and you shouldn't feel shy, like, like a, a, a less good answer would be to say I haven't had any failures. Um, an American reader actually wants to hear a little bit about um, something that you've struggled with and something you've overcome. Um, so if you had a project that didn't go so well, um, but then you figured out ways to fix it or you learned what, what you're going to do differently next time, um, American audiences actually want, want to hear about that. Um, it's not something to be embarrassed about as long as you can describe um, how, you, how you overcame that challenge. Um, so those are my tips for having a strong application. Um, so do I get to choose my host organizations and also can I suggest a host organization if they're not already on a list of current partners? Um, so yes, you can suggest host organizations. Um, there's no guarantee necessarily that, they, that you'll be able to be placed there, but it is helpful if you um, tell us either in the interview or, um, or send us an email to say, you know, what host organizations you're interested in being placed with um, because then that helps our partnerships team um, be able to, to look for those host organizations. But again, it, it's really no guarantee. Um, it really depends on the host organization deciding that's a good fit. Um, as far as the question of do I get to choose my host organization, so um, Atlas Core actually matches strong candidates um, who are finalists to our um, to our uh, potential host organizations. So basically, at the same time that we're recruiting candidates and fellows uh, like like you guys, um, we're also recruiting potential host organizations. Um, and then we try to match them up based on what the host organization is looking for, what the fellow is looking for. Um, so um, if a host organization, will, they'll send us a description saying, we're really looking for someone who has expertise in human rights and um, international law and s speaks Arabic um, and can do uh, report writing. So they'll send us some brief description of what they're looking for and then we'll look in our pool of qualified strong applicants and see if we have a fit for that position and then we'll try and match them up. The host organization will then choose who they want to interview um, and uh, they'll interview some candidates and decide who they want to select, if anyone. Um, sometimes host organizations decide that not to accept anyone. Um, so 
Um, it can really vary, um, but but basically we work on that matching process. And so if you have an, an idea in your head of where you would like to be placed, you should try and make sure your skills and interests come through really strongly on your application. Um, that you have a strong narrative in your application of these are the things that you know I'm these are my strengths these are the things I'm good at these are the things I'm interested in and that will help us um, match you with a host organization and then you know if you do get an interview with a host organization then that's your opportunity to ask questions and make sure it's a good fit for you to ask about what you'll be doing what opportunities there are for, for pro professional growth things like that um, in order to um, uh, in order to determine that it's a good fit for you um, even even if you get an offer from a, from both Atlas Core and a host organization of the fellowship, you still have the opportunity uh, to say yes or to say no. Um, you know, you're you're not required to accept um, a placement at a host organization that um, you don't think is a good fit for you. Um, that being said, we do encourage finalists to accept all interviews that come their way. So if you have an opportunity for an interview, you might as well just take it and maybe learn more about it. And maybe it'll, if, if it doesn't seem like a good fit immediately, maybe it'll seem like a good fit after you spend an hour talking to um, that potential supervisor. So that's how the matching process works. Um, it, it's more something that Atlas Core does rather than candidates. Um, but that being said, feel free to um, let us know if you have um, ideas of where you'd like to be placed. Um, so if chosen, what will my role in my host organization be? Yeah, so it's a wide range of roles. Um, you could be um, working on anything from developing trainings to doing direct social service and, and counseling to um, writing reports and doing research, grants management. There's such a wide range of roles that our fellows are working on. Um, the important thing to know is that it's not an internship. You would be treated like, um, you know, like a, a member of the team and, and expected to contribute. So, um, but that also means that you'll have a say in um, determining the direction of your fellowship, um, coming up with ideas and projects that you um, that you'd like to contribute. So, um, you're you're really given a chance to to lead during your, your fellowship um, and uh, de determine what you, how you'd like to shape your role in the host organization. Um, but that being said, it, you know, there's a lot of different roles that our fellows uh, can do and so um, it, it, really determine, it really depends on um, what the host organization is looking for and what the fellow is, is good at. Um, so, what is the fellowship experience like outside of the host organization? Great. So, um, outside of the host organization, um, uh, there's a really strong fellow community. Um, a lot of fellows even live together, um, and uh, um, there, there's that real opportunity for cross-cultural exchange. I love seeing our fellows. Um, you know, after after work today, there's even a bunch of fellows getting together. Um, you know, at, at a restaurant for a drink, um, and and you know, we'll have fellows there from uh, from India and South Africa and um, you know Mexico, wherever like a, a wide range of countries represented at that one table, and it's really special to see that cross cultural exchange, um, and that really is what pushes people's um, uh, boundaries and it forces them to um, to grow and and change their perspective as as outstanding nonprofit leaders. Um, you know, beyond that, there's further opportunities for professional development, um, like conferences and events that our fellows go to. Um, our, our, a lot of our fellows are, are going to a particular conference up in New York later this month. Um, so there's opportunities like that. There's also just fun events. We have an events calendar that we share with our fellows and, and try and look for opportunities for them to um, attend either fun events or even professional events um, that, uh, you know, can develop their professional skills but also just, you know, learn more about U.S. culture, learn more about other fellows' cultures, and, and um, I think that's a really cool part of the fellowship. Um, so where will I live in the course of my fellowship? Yeah, um, so it's important to note that housing is ultimately the responsibility of the fellow um, where they live um, and that they can choose where they would like to live. Um, 
in Washington, D.C., um, we have several group houses where our fellows live um, that are managed by an external property company. Um, placement in those houses is not guaranteed. Um, we've, it's it's uh, on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, that being said, we, we've usually had um, spots available for most of the fellows who wanted it. Um, and uh, they're, they're group houses where um, you'd be living with other fellows, occasionally one or two other Americans, um, and, uh, and, and really getting uh, to spend a lot of time with other fellows and, and benefit from that cross-cultural exchange. Um, you can also live on your own. We do have fellows who choose to um, look for their own housing um, and look for, um, you know, you'll look for something within the city or live with a friend or family um, here in the U.S. Um, in other cities besides CC, because um, we do have fellows serving in um, other cities like New York, um, San Francisco, Atlanta, some other cities, um, we, we do ask host organizations to um, give suggestions of where to live and, and, and um, uh, provide an option for fellows to, to, to look at. Um, but again, it, it's ultimately the responsibility of the fellow, fellow and they may have to do some, um, some uh, housing searches on their own, um, but all, all our fellows living in other cities have been able to to find um, affordable housing in their city. So, um, so that's a little bit about housing. Great. So, what what kind of budgeting will I have to do? Yeah. So it's a very um, it's a it's a limited stipend. Well, we consider it enough for food, shared housing, and local transportation. Um, it's it's not enough to for to go out a lot um, and to or to live in an expensive apartment. When we say shared housing, that you know we consider you, you'll you'll you should have enough money to live in a place where you can have your own room, um, but you will likely have to share a bathroom um, and um, share common areas. Uh, it, it's usually not enough for like a, a one bedroom apartment for you to stay in by yourself. Um, any travel or tourism you want to do within the U.S., um, the, the, the budget is kind of tight for that, and so a lot of our fellows who travel either budget specifically for, for their travel um, or they're dipping into their savings a little bit. Um, and uh, you know, we don't expect this, um, this stipend to be enough to necessarily cover um, emergencies unless you're, you know, it, it's a very limited stipend. It's, to cover food, shared housing, and local transportation, um, but we do consider it manageable if you budget. Um, the uh, the stipend is actually based on the amount that American volunteers get when they're volunteering as part of a, a service program called AmeriCorps here in the U.S. Um, so it's actually um, a little bit more than what uh, American volunteers are making as part of our, our domestic service program. Um, so we do think it's manageable if you budget, um, but, but you would have to stick to a budget. Um, and uh, we think it's challenging, but it's worth it, and, and you can really grow from living on a basic stipend. Um, I think it's really cool when um, at the end of the year when we talk about what we've learned from the fellowship, a number of fellows are like, I learned to cook because um, you know, in order to live on this budget, you really have to be cooking your own meals most of the time, um, and things like that. And uh, you know, it, you know, not all of, a lot of our fellows are not necessarily used to doing that, and uh, are come in and, and jump right in, are excited about learning how to learning how to do that, um, which I think is really cool. Great. So when I when I start my fellowship, can I bring my family? Yeah. So we. Um, we discourage people from bringing their family um, because, um, for one thing, we don't sponsor family members on visas. Um, so, so fellows are coming in on on what's called a J1 visa, um, and there's a, a a visa for family members called a J2 visa. We do not sponsor family members on visas. Um, uh, n the visa is only for the the fellow himself or herself. Um, moreover, the stipend and the health insurance are really intended for only one person. Um, so, like I talked about, how the stipend is, is kind of a, a limited um, amount and um, uh, requires budgeting. Uh, you know, you can imagine it will be even just that much tougher if you're trying to stretch that budget for two people. So, um, the stipend and the health insurance are really only intended for one person. Um, so, so most people who apply with with family. Um, you know, where uh, 
they, sh they should be prepared that most likely they'll be spending uh, the year apart from their family. Um, unless, and if the family chooses to come visit, that will be um, on their, um, that'll be, they'll be responsible for the expenses themselves and, and getting a, a visa for themselves. Um, that being said, we have had fellows who um, have family come and stay with them here um, for um, several months or a significant part of the fellowship or even just tourism, you know, coming for a week or so. Um, again, that is totally um, something that the fellows can choose to do and um, something that they would be responsible for both the financial cost of, of bringing that family here as well as the visa because we're not going to sponsor their tourism visa or any other kind of visa for our fellows family members. Great. So uh, what should I expect out of the Atlas Core training program or the Global yeah. Leadership Lab? Yeah, so um, I think we, um, you know, I should actually uh, maybe even have, maybe have you talk about this because we, uh, uh, Deponta is our training manager and has really, um, our, our training program has grown so much um, even in just the past year. Um, so our training program, it's, uh, we have three four-day immersions is what we call them um, throughout the, the fellowship year. Um, so one in January, one in May, and one in September, a four-day immersion where we invite um, experts from the nonprofit sector from, from a field to come and give trainings on topics that our fellows have determined to be the most important and valuable topics for nonprofit leaders to know. Um, so those topics can range from um, financial management to fundraising to social media, um, a, a, a variety of topics that we consider to be like our, our core curriculum, um, if, you, if you can call it that, of what, what we consider to be essential skills for nonprofit leaders. Um, and, and so they um, have these trainings from um, experts in the field. We also have a monthly webinar um, that uh, can range from either supplementing one of those um, one of those topics that we covered in an immersion, um, or it could be a, a content-based webinar, something about a specific issue, um, and it really a chance to dig deeper on some of these issues. Uh, and then we've also, um, DePonta has, has developed our online um, platform a lot um, in the past several months of, uh, you know, we have a website for our, our fellows uh, to access our trainings um, that includes um, discussions and readings online. Um, I know sometimes I mention that and people are are a little bit scared by that, thinking like, "Oh my gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be serving full time at this host organization and doing like a full time course or something." It's actually not quite like that. You you spend most you know your 40 hour work week most of your time is at your host organization. These um, immersions and webinars are are only um, they're spread out through the year, um, and uh, it, it's not like a full time course. It's not like you're a student at a university. Um, it's more just to, to um, supplement what you're, you're learning at your host organization. It, it's not like you're a full-time student. Um, anything else you want to add about the Global Leadership Lab? Um, I cover it? <laughs> no, I, I, think, uh, I, I think you've covered most of it, but also in this case, the fellows do have an opportunity, to, if they happen to be an expert in something, to right. also uh, use that as a platform to you know, train others or, or teach others about you know your area of expertise, yeah. so it's a it's a very fellow-driven program. It's not really uh, an imposition or a syllabus that you need to cover. So. Right. Yeah. And I, and I, also, I think uh, the strongest part of the um, Global Leadership Lab is is not just what um, the experts we invite in uh, tell our fellows, but also what fellows can share with each other. Um, fellows are really learning a lot from each other. Um, like. In my country, we do it this way. Or does anyone have any good suggestions um, for a way to address this this issue I'm having, in, you know, with my grant applications or whatever? Um, you know, fellows are are constantly feeding off of each other um, and and building that global network. Um, and, and we see that all the time of, of fellows learning from each other in these these. Um, trainings and, and that's why we feel like it's so important to bring all our fellows across the country, you know, even the fellows coming all the way from San Francisco um, can come in for our trainings in Washington DC and, and we all come together and learn from each other. Great. So uh, really the final question is, so what happens to me after the fellowship in terms of support and 
career. Yeah, so um, so first I want to cover um, a couple um, uh, requirements of the fellowship that people often have questions about. Um, so we talk about how there's a commi commitment to return to your home country after the fellowship. Um, a lot of fellows or candidates ask, um, is it okay if I go back to a different country besides my home country? Um, yes, that, you know, that's fine, especially if it's in your home region. Um, so like a fellow from Nigeria gets a job in Ethiopia um, where she's still working in the nonprofit sector and all of that. Uh, you know, that is, is totally fine and we, we support that. Um, and so um, it, it's more important that you continue to uh, work in the social sector in, um, in countries around the world, um, that, that's more important to us than the specific country that you go back to necessarily. Um, though we, we do want you to return to your home country first, um, and, then, and then from there, um, it's up to you. Um, also, uh, a number of fellows asked about that requirement of, of going back home, especially um, you know, what if I want to apply for grad schools, things like that. So it's important to know that there's kind of two different requirements that we're talking about. There's the Atlas Core requirement, which is a one-year commitment to you know return to your home country or home region um, and work in the nonprofit sector. There's also the State Department, which um, puts uh, a two-year home residency requirement on some, but not all, visas. Um, that, you know that that residency requirement is is for you to to stay home for a couple years before applying for for a new visa um, to come back to the U.S. So there's kind of two different requirements we're talking about. Uh, we, we have control of the, over the Alice Corps requirement, the, the one-year requirement. We don't have control over the State Department requirement. Um, that being said, you know a lot of fellows ask, oh, can I still come back to the U.S. for a conference or tourism, or can I come back for grad school? Yes, um, you, you can do that. Um, you know, even the two-year home residency requirement does not um, does not uh, prevent you necessarily from coming back for grad school on an F-1 visa or another J-1 training program or tourism on a B-1 visa. So um, it, it doesn't prevent you from doing that, nor does the um, one-year one year Atlas Core requirement prevent you from doing that. Um, if you do um, get an opportunity in the U.S. to do grad school or some other training program, um, and uh, we, we just ask that you will say, uh, okay, we'll we'll have to write a letter to our um, the Alice Corps board for approval for a waiver from the Alice Corps one year home residency requirement, and if that um, if that your request is given approval and, and we feel like there's st we still think that there's a strong chance that you'll return home at the at the end of whatever program you're doing, um, you know, then we'll just say okay, your your one year home residency requirement is just going to be delayed a year. And so at, at the end of your, you know, say, grad program uh, or whatever it is that you're coming back for, you'll just have to, you'll, you'll just be delayed until the end of that program, and you'll have to go back at the end of that program. So we do have fellows come back within their one year um, for grad school, um, and, and we usually support, um, you know, fellows to continue to develop their, their training like that. Um, and then finally, um, you know, to talk about, I want to talk about alumni engagement and how, what kinds of opportunities there are for our alumni. Um, we think that there's um, a strong network of, of fellows uh, around the world that really helps support each other, and we even see, um, you know, fellows telling each other about potential job opportunities or like, hey, check out this great opportunity, um, and, and, and telling each other, um, and, and we're always on the lookout. We also think it, it's a boost to your resume that you have this um, experience in the U.S. Um, serving with leading nonprofit organizations and NGOs. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that is definitely something that helps our fellows' career prospects when they go back home. Um, we also try and provide um, other opportunities. For example, we, we have a, a discounted um, uh, uh, membership with DevX, which, which is an international uh, development jobs website. So uh, our fellows can take advantage of um, you know, networking with, um, with 
NGOs around the world through DevX and this recruitment, or sorry, this uh, career account with DevX. That's one of the benefits they offer. You know, also some of these conferences I mentioned earlier, uh, we also um, try and provide support for alumni to go to those conferences if they choose to as well. Um, so, um, and we also provide uh, access to our webinars or our other global leadership lab trainings for alumni. So we still, you know, want to engage alumni um, and uh, provide support for their career path. Um, you know, we're not necessarily able to do career counseling for every country out there. Um, you know, we're, we're not experts on the um, the the jobs that you know the employment. In, in Russia or Brazil, um, but we find that other fellows are a great resource and, uh, and that um, what we can do is we can provide support through networking and providing a recommendation um, and, and that, um, that, that overall network of the Atlas Core Fellows is really going to be the, a really strong boost to your, um, your career prospects. Great. Um, well, before I take questions, was there anything you wanted to add, Zapata? Anything that you think I didn't cover? <laughs> no, I, I think this was pretty comprehensive, but you know, you should just go ahead and start filling in the application, and uh, yeah, and, and best of luck. Great. Um, yeah, so if you have, um, I'm going to take a few questions, if there's any questions that people um, typed in on our, our webinar, um, but if I don't get to your question or if you have questions later, um, feel free to email apply at atlascore.org um, with the subject line question from a webinar participant, um, and then we'll make sure to see, oh, okay, you know, that's someone who is on our webinar and they, they have a question for us. So um, let me see if there were any questions that, that you guys wrote to us um, on, on the webinar, and then um, if um, we, if you have other questions, just email us. Um, I know I know a couple of people asked whether this webinar will be recorded. Um, yes, it is. It is recorded, and you'll actually still be able to access the the entire um, webinar by going to the same link that you went to 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 watch this webinar. So um, all of it will still be up online. Um, and let's see. One person ask, is asking, is it allowed to choose um, the timeline for any case? So, for example, um, what, what, what I think they mean by this question is, can they choose which class they apply for? Yes, you can, you can, there's a question in the application of which classes you'd like to apply for. Um, so right now we're, we're accepting applications for um, January 2014, but you could apply now and just put you know, May 2014, um, you know, for example, if you don't graduate until spring of next year um, from graduate school or whatever, um, you could still apply now for the, the next class. But right now we're, we're, we're focused on do, placing fellows for our January 2014 class, but um, you can still list which classes you're interested in applying for on the application. So we can take that into consideration. Um, and like I said before, and it's just worth reiterating because it's so important, if at any time you'd like to withdraw your application from consideration, say you just got a promotion or you just um, got some other opportunity that's going to take you out of consideration for one, one application cycle or two application cycles or um, permanently, um, please do let us know at apply at atlascore.org. Um, it's super important. Um, so that, that we uh, know what your, your current status is. Um, let's see, I think, um, I think those were all the questions, but, um, oh, someone, someone else asked, will the procurement, procurement of a J-1 visa, if I'm successful, ex affect my current B-2 visa? Um, no, it won't. So, you can, we can sponsor you on a J-1 visa and you could come to the fellowship um, and, um, but you'd still have your tourist visa uh, and that's fine. There's okay. another question. Can I apply for and also Columbia? Do I need to choose? Great question. Um, so we, um, you can actually apply for both programs, uh, both our Columbia Fellowship and the U.S. Fellowship. 
One additional requirement that the Columbia Fellowship has uh, that the U.S. Fellowship does not is that the, the Columbia Fellowship um, requires that you not only be proficient in English, but also proficient in, um, in Spanish. So, um, and, and that's so that you can function in a, in a Colombian work environment and, and really contribute um, there. So, um, so we have ha most of our fellows in Colombia have been um, have been American. We've also had Spanish fellows uh, serve in Colombia, um, but we'd be open to any you know bilingual English and Spanish speaking applicants uh, to apply for both programs. It's separate applications, um, so you'll see on our apply page there's a apply to the U.S. link, and then there's apply for Colombia or apply for Latin America link. Um, so there's two. Two separate applications that you would have to fill out both, but they're very, very similar. Um, so it, it's a very similar process for Columbia. You'd actually be able to copy most of your answers into the other one. So if you are Spanish speaking, I really encourage you to apply for both because um, they're both fantastic opportunities and it increases your odds. Um, let's see. One person asks, um, are there are there any special requirements for applicants for from Sudan or South Sudan? Um, so, not really. There's no special requirements. Um, one thing that is important to note um, that I think I mentioned earlier, but it's worth reiterating: the South Sudan Fellowship is a six-month fellowship, not a 12-month fellowship. Um, so you have to be prepared to go to go back to your home country of South Sudan after six months. Um, but other than that, it's all the same um, requirements, and it's the same um, application that you fill out. You don't even have to specify anything. We'll see uh, on your application. You know, there, there will be a spot for you to, to, to list your citizenship as South Sudan or where you're from as South Sudan um, and, and will take you into consideration for this special initiative that I mentioned. Um, let's see, someone else asked if they recently finished their undergrad um, program and they're currently on OPT, which stands for Optional Practical Training. Um, it's a particular visa status here in the U.S. Can I still apply? Yes, absolutely, you can still apply um, even if you just finished up a grad program in the U.S. or you're still on OPT. Go ahead and apply um, and then, um, you know, we, we, can, we can take that into consideration and talk through your specific visa case, but basically shouldn't be a problem um, and as long as you're committed to returning home at the end of the fellowship. Um, absolutely, go ahead and apply. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, how okay. can you? Uh, how, so one person is asking, how do you determine a strong candidate to advance them to the stage of taking the English test? Um, so that initial determination is made based on whether you fit our eligibility requirements, whether you've filled out the application completely. Um, so, so really, when when it says um, you know that those essay those essays, it, there's a three hundred word maximum, but there's also a 100 word minimum to make sure that you've actually written something substantive for the entire application, that you have two years of experience in the nonprofit sector. We're really basing it off of, um, does this application look like someone who has the potential later on to be placed with a host organization? Do they, are they eligible for our program and have they filled out the application completely? Um, and, and, and is their English um, good enough that we want to um, give them a test? Uh, you know, if, if it's uh, if if the English is so weak that um, we can tell right off the right off the bat that you know their English may not be strong enough for the program, we may not advance them to, to the English test. Um, but but usually if you if you're eligible and you filled out the application completely, um, we will consider you for the English test. Um, Calls to see. and fro from the yeah. So someone asked, um, does the program cover travel to and from the U.S.? Yes. So we would cover an international flight. Um, from your from the capital city of your home country um, to to the U.S. Um, and then uh, as well as local travel to the capital city of up to 150 U.S. dollars. Um, so so we cover that flight. Um, let's see. Someone's asking. I applied last year and reached the finalist stage, but I did not get an organization. Can I apply again for January? Um, so I think that's. That's a question um, right into apply to askcore.org so we can look at your specific case. Because um, like we said, we, we keep your application on file for up to a year, and after that we ask that you reapply. So I'd have to know kind of exactly when did you apply. Um, 
and whether you necessarily need to reapply or if we've already have your application on file. So it kind of depends uh, on exactly when you applied. But if you applied more than a year ago, then, then yes, you'll, you'll likely have to reapply. Um, then uh, sh I think Remy wants a, a clarification about the timeline thing. Yes, so, so for timeline about wh what class you apply for, yes, you can, um, you can list on your application whether you'd like to be considered for our January class, our May class, or our September class, or all three, or just two of those, um, and, and we take that into consideration. Um, you know, if you, um, that being said, if you do get an offer from a host organization who wants to bring you on as a fellow, and they're offering you uh, a, a start date of January 2014, that is um, non-negotiable. So um, what, once you've been offered, you can't necessarily defer, um, but you can determine up front at the beginning of the process what class you'd like to be considered for. Um, someone else asked, uh, will I receive feedback within two weeks' time after submission of my documents? Um, so you'll receive a confirmation email that you submitted your application, um, but it's, it's unlikely that you'll necessarily receive um, feedback or you know, move on to the next step within two weeks after submission of, of your, your application. If you submit it right on, on the deadline, of uh, our priority deadline is July 15th, um, you, you may receive an English test within two weeks, you may not. Um, so it kind of depends. Uh, like I said, that, that selection process and placement process um, can take up, up to four months um, for a single application cycle. So, um, so you may have to wait a little bit longer from two weeks to, to, to know um, what the next step, to know whether you've moved on to the next step, um, and certainly you'll have to wait longer than two weeks to know whether you've been accepted or not. Um, let's see, I think, um, I, have to see. I think I've covered most, um, most of the applicants, or most of the questions. Um, oh, someone else asked, um, that they are a master's student of business computing. Are there any requirements for type of university qualification? Um, so, when we say bachelor's degree or um, or equivalent, that means that it will um, that we're looking for someone who who's studied at a four year college usually. Um, so um, it, it varies from country to country, but I'd say if you're doing a master's program or if you've already completed your undergrad um, and, and are now doing a master's program, that's great. Um, and and even if you, if even if you're not in a master's program, if if you've at least completed an undergraduate degree of, at at like a three or four year college, um, that should be enough. Um, and then finally, someone asked the matching process between applicant and host is is working around year or does it have a deadline time? So each class has a deadline for when we're when we're finalizing placement for um, that class. Um, so right now we're actually just finishing up placement for our September class. Um, so for each class there is a deadline and we'll, we'll update all our applicants and let them know, you know whether or not they were selected for the next class. Um, that being said, we're recruiting potential host organizations year round. We're trying to place people year round. Um, but th there, is a, there is a certain cutoff point of after which we cannot place someone for the next class, or else it's going to be leaving a, not enough time to get your, their visa. So, um, so kind of yes and no. <laughs> there is a, a deadline, but at the same time, we're doing it year round. Um, and then finally, someone um, asked about is it possible to download this um, later? So, um, yes, you you can watch this later go to the same link that you follow to watch this webinar, and you'll be able to, to watch the same webinar um, over and, and even, um, I think you can download the video um, and make sure that you're following everything we talked about. So that's all the questions we have time for today. Um, it's because it's been about an hour. Um, any further questions, I encourage you to email apply at atlascore.org. That's A-P-P-L-Y at atlascore. Remember, there's an S at the end of atlascore.org. And um, we'll try and get to those questions um, as soon as possible. And thank you so much for joining us on our very first U.S. Fellowship Recruitment Webinar. Um, I hope it was informative and helpful. And um, we really look forward to some great applications 
um, for our January class and, and, and 2014 in general. Um, and, and we appreciate your, your interest in, in ASCOR. Thank you. Best of luck. Thanks.